Well, welcome to yet another episode of the Ecosiv podcast. Um, your host, Andrew Schwartz, co-founder and vice president of Ecosiv. And it is a genuine pleasure to have Tim Jackson with me today. Uh, Tim is a, a world famous ecological economist and author. He's director of the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, uh, which is a multidisciplinary research center uh, with the aim of understanding the um, economic, social, and political dimensions of flourishing as human beings on a finite planet. Uh, Tim has worked closely with uh, the UK government, the United Nations, the European Commission, numerous nonprofits, uh, private companies, and foundations, um, all working toward bringing economic and social science research into sustainability frameworks. So, uh, perhaps best known for his groundbreaking book, uh, Prosperity Without Growth, uh, Tim's most recent book, Post Growth life after capitalism is actually described as a manifesto for system change and an invitation for deeper conversation about the nature of the human condition. And that's something I, I hope we get to talk about today because we'll be talking about post-capitalism, post-growth economies and the future of work for the long-term well-being of people on the planet. Tim, thank you for joining me. It's a real pleasure, Andrew. So, I want to talk about post-capitalism, post-growth economies, but it seems like before we get into the details of this alternative paradigm, it might be helpful to talk about why this is needed, right? What's so bad about capitalism and growth economies such that we actually need to go beyond them, that we need to transcend them? Mm. Yeah. Um, you should ask the people on the streets in Glasgow um, I'm actually, um, <laughs> I'm actually just uh, up in Scotland at the moment, and uh, I've had a really interesting time, sort of going between um, George Square, for example, where the Fridays for Future march assembled um, on Friday, and uh, the Blue Zone in the official UN COP negotiations, and and this it's it's quite a it's quite an interesting con contrast in a way because. You know, the kids on the street basically are sort of saying the system sucks and um, growth is a fairy tale um, and capitalism is, capitalism is becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And then in the official negotiations in the COP, you know, everything is basically, you know, business as usual, but how can we solve this little problem of climate change without messing up too much of the existing system? And, <laughs> and so... You, you know, in a very obvious terms, a constantly expanding economy is a difficult thing to manage on a finite planet when, when, when the boundaries are, are basically fixed and, you know, you, you can't just go on expanding the, the reach and the impact of one species ad infinitum without affecting everybody else. And, you know, I think capitalism, to some extent, you know, it's the system that we live in and it's deeply implicated in that growth-based expansionary economy in fact you could say and and marx once did say that that expansion accumulation is the very foundation of of capitalism um, and and it has some structural properties which which we can discuss in a little bit more detail if it's interesting to which kind of relate it to all sorts of environmental and social problems and it's basically the sort of centrality of that idea that we're all motivated by profit maximization and uh and so so as a system i mean as a system it's kind of running up against the boundaries it's running up against the the sort of the limits of what it can achieve um and yet it's who we are you know that's the system we live in that's our culture that's our history, that's where we belong. And hence that sort of invitation to kind of think beyond it, to think of, of what it means really to be human on a finite planet. Absolutely, and I think what, what you're describing, I think is, is so beautiful that you've got people on the streets, um, young generations, people who, are, who are, are completely awake to the fact that whatever we have now, it's not working for everybody. Um, maybe working for a handful of people really, really well. Uh, although at least uh, that's not true in, insofar as those people actually need the planet to, uh, to continue to live. But then you're also getting to this fact that there's um, 
something about the human condition, something about what it means to be human um, that's wrapped up in how economics uh, sort of, how economies work, right? Um, so what's, does this post-growth, post-capitalist framework require a new way of understanding what it means to be human? I, I think it does. Um, you know, what I, want, what I wanted to do with, with post-growth, um, which is a very different kind of book to the, the previous one, Prosperity Without Growth. Prosperity Without Growth started its life as a report to the UK government. And it was very policy oriented, you know, it was a careful examination of the impact of growth on the planet, how fast you could decouple growth from that impact, uh, what the policy prescriptions could be, where growth actually does matter on the planet. And that's quite an important part of things because you, you know, you have to understand that actually there are places in the planet, um, countries where the poorest people live, where a growth in income is undeniably a good thing. And, and when I looked at the evidence for that back in the day, it's very, very clear that if you increase the incomes in the poorest people in the world, then you increase life expectancy, you reduce infant mortality, you increase participation in education, all of the indicators go in the right direction at that very, very poorest part of the population. And it's, it's really in the rich countries, and it's a sort of challenge to the rich countries to kind of think about their economic model, about what they think of as progress. And wrapped up in our idea of progress is this sense of, of kind of always having more, having the ability to have more, more and more all the time is better. And, and that, to an extent, is the DNA of capitalism, that, you know, having more is a good thing. And yet, and it's one of the things I point to in post grace you know, one of the lessons in the pandemic was uh, that the, the, the very basis, the fundamental basis of prosperity really is, is health. And health is not about having more and more. Health, you could say, really is about the idea of balance, about not having too little and not having too much and finding that balance. And, and interestingly, one of the things that we've done by having this, you know, this uh, idea that progress is all about having more and more and setting up our economic system about having more and more all the time is, is we've pushed ourselves out of balance. In fact, we've pushed population health so far out of balance that we know from the World Health Organization, more people now die from diseases of overconsumption than they do from undernutrition. And that's an extraordinary thing to, to, to live in such a world in which, I mean, obviously there are still people dying from malnutrition and that, that's awful and it's tragic and we should be concerned about that. But we should also be concerned that, you know, in the rich countries and even across the middle income and poorer countries, there are more and more people dying from overconsumption. We're pushing ourselves out of the balance of growth. And it's non-trivial, you know, when people... Right are over consuming, they're not so well, they're not so fit, they're more, um, they can succumb to the diseases of, of affluence, the hypertension, the, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, all of that stuff. And that makes them more susceptible, in fact, to things like COVID. So mm -hmm. you, come, you, know, you come right back full circle. What's the lesson of that pandemic? Health matters. Health is about balance. Capitalism is pushing us out of balance. And we end up actually with an unhealthy population as well as an unhealthy world. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think balance is going to be critical. And, and what does that balance look like is something I want to explore. But you mentioned some things about uh, growth and about prosperity. And there's also this notion of, of development. And I'm curious if you see this idea of sustainable development is it an oxymoron, you know, what the UN is presenting in, through the SDGs? I mean, is this compatible with a post-growth economy? Uh, well, the, the SDGs, you know, the SDGs is like, a, is like a, a kind of, if you like, if you take it seriously, it could be a roadmap. It's a set of indicators. It's a, a sort of panel of indicators which tells you how you're doing in different areas. Um, when you ask me about sustainable development, I mean, in some ways, it's a funny story. I was the I was the first professor of sustainable development in the UK. I was appointed in 2000. And then in 2004, I was appointed as economics commissioner 
on the Sustainable Development Commission. So that sounds like I should tell you, yes, yeah, sustainable development <laughs> is where it's at. Sustainable development goals, that's what we have to do. And it's, it's quite interesting because if you're, you know, if you're a professor of something, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe that it's the fundamental prescription for the good life. What you have to do if you're a professor of something is to study that something. So, you know, what I would say about sustainable development is it has been a useful way of thinking about the paradigm that we live in and trying to change that and sort of saying, well, development is not the same thing as growth necessarily. Development means different things in different parts of the world, probably. Development has to fit within the confines of the planet, it has to be sustainable. So, so what the terminology of sustainable development could potentially be doing is, is getting us to ask some of these difficult questions. But I also know, because I'm a professor of sustainable development, that some people think sustainable development is just business as usual. It's just, you know, tinkering at the edges of a system that's already broken. And I think, you know, there is some logic to that, that when terms like sustainable development get captured by the status quo, they stop being able to do the work of change. And, and that's an important thing to, to, to continue to be able to do, to keep that concept of alive, to keep it as a, a living concept, to make sure that it's pushing us towards progress rather than hiding the avenues through which progress has to come. So right. it's, to me, you know, the UN, and it, you're right, it belongs to the UN to some extent, it belongs in the Sustainable Development Goals, um, but we shouldn't kid ourselves, it's doing all that deep work that we need to do to critique where we are. Yeah, that makes sense to me, because I, I think I, so if sustainable if sustainable development just means sustained growth. Um, then it seems like that, as, as you had indicated, on a finite planet, that's not an actual that's not a viable option. Yeah. Um, so then if development doesn't equal growth, um, could development mean um, sustained prosperity? Um, or something like that. I mean, could you could you? Yeah, for sure. Tweak with. Yeah, I mean, I think, as I say, you, you, we, we're in a quite a difficult place because, in a sense, all we've got to kind of articulate our dreams is language, yeah, and right. and language itself is is not. You know, we're not really fully masters of language. Language is something that we can, you know, corral for the purposes of rhetorical um, debate. It's something that we can use to communicate with each other. But as soon as you kind of fix on language and sort of argue that it should be, it's the, the language is the vision. As soon as the language is the vision, then that's the point, particularly if it's successful in articulating that vision, that's the point everybody wants a piece of it. So sustainable hmm. development started out as a radical idea. As soon as everybody wants a piece of it, the question is, have they changed in terms of, you know, what they want that to represent that language? Sometimes not. Sometimes, you know, the language gets kind of captured, as I say, and, and you find that actually it's just being used as a term to support the status quo. And that's the point okay. we have to, that's the point we have to resist. And, um, you know, I mean, it's interesting on the streets, for example, we have, you know, slogans like system change, not climate change, or you know, at one point during the pandemic, we had build back better and build back better for those who were critiquing the system meant system change. It meant doing something different. But in the hands of of the establishment, build back better means, you know, more investment in all the things that we had before and all the technologies that we believe will save us. And and as, as soon as something becomes popular as a slogan, you can guarantee that some people will come in behind it and capture it or use it for their own purposes. And, and in some sense, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. That is the way that language works. So one day, soon, I hope, <laughs> someone's going to be coming along and capturing post-growth. And, yeah. you know, and our task will be to make sure that as they capture it, they capture also some of the change that that is calling for in terms of the underlying system. Absolutely. And it's the underlying system um, changing that, that I, I want to really, I, I want to, I want you to explain that a little bit more. What would that look like? But I'm also curious on the, 
so are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater when we're talking about post-capitalism and post-growth? I mean, is there a correlation between GDP and prosperity? Does the increase of one mean the increase of the other? Um, well, that's that's kind of what I was sort of indicating before with the statistical work that I did, you know, when I was economics commissioner. And, and, and it does, you know, prosperity correlates well with economic growth in the poorest parts of the world. You know, when the GDP... Nice. Okay is less than, actually, it turns out to be quite specific for most of the indicators. It's G, when GDP is less than about ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 per capita, then you get a very high correlation. You know, as you go from nothing to about $15,000 per capita, your life expectancy can be expected to double. And that's significant increase in prosperity. So we have to sort of say that that works at that level. And then after that point, you know, that correlation drops off massively and sometimes you're out of it balance. Goes, because you're out of balance and because right. actually you know you don't need more and more food and more and more housing more and more shelter more and more electricity which is the things that that early growth gives you and and at that point you know you then have to think about well i'm not getting that increase in prosperity and i'm but i am increasing the impact on the planet so that's and and that impact on the planet sometimes is even taking away from the poorest in society, those people for whom growth really would matter. So, and, and that's the kind of, you know, I think that's the hard work we have to do in critiquing our situation. We, we shouldn't be running away with the idea that this mantra of economic growth is what we should always be looking for. And we should always have an eye to what's happening on, with the poorest people on the planet, that not forgetting that actually for them development means having some income with which they can just you know provide themselves and their families with a decent quality of life so you're already starting to to paint a picture for me and i want i want to you know I, i'm i'm dubbing you now the artist and i'm going to have you paint a picture even more what does a post-capitalist post-growth society look like um what does employment yeah. and labor look like in this paradigm i mean is everything publicly owned? Uh, what's the length of the average work week? Uh, how's what about the average commute? You know, what kind of jobs do people have? I'm thinking about uh, you know automation. Is it are, are functions increasingly automated in a post capitalist world? Um, is income guaranteed? You talked about how important it is to have income to a certain point. Um, I, oh my goodness! Yeah. you want me to you want me to answer? Or you want me to? It, you you just to paint the paint the picture. Yeah. presidents of the world decide yes on these. exactly i will I'm, vote I'm for you resist, okay <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna resist just a little bit andrew not entirely <laughs> not entirely but what i want to say you know kind of what i want to say first is and this is really what post growth was trying to do it was trying to say you know if we've got this challenge ahead of us that the system of capitalism isn't quite working as it should and that growth actually in the advanced economies, the growth rates have been declining for, for several decades. And we're likely, in, there's a sense in which in the UK, we're already living in a post-growth economy because our labor productivity growth rates have fallen consistently and are now almost below zero. So there is a sense in which we're already living in that world. So shouldn't we think about what really matters to us in that world? So that's, you know, that's, and that's in a sense what post-growth is doing. It's sort of saying, you know, it's looking inside the system of capitalism and saying, why is it driving us in this direction? What are its values? And are its values really our values? And what are our values? What do we think we should value in society? And, and, and a part of what post-growth um, is, is doing is, is beginning that task, but arguing also, and this is where I'm kind of resisting a little bit your invitation to be, you know, president of the universe, that that actually should be the subject of a, of a public conversation, a conversation that we're all having about the kind of culture we want, the kind of world that we want to live in, and about the values that we want to be embedded in that world. And asking in particular, you know, is the value, are the values that are embedded in capitalism, are they really what we want to think about? So let's just take that example of work since you kind of raised it, you know, and the, 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 um, there was a guy called um, uh, Fritz Schumacher who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of that some time ago, I mean, you know, kind of 1950s, 60s. And, um, you know, one of the chapters in that is called um, Buddhist Economics, which is a great title for, for a chapter about economics. 
And in Buddhist economics, basically Schumacher points to this idea that when you think about work, if you're a producer, if you're making something, if you're running a company, workers are a cost to you. So you want to, you know, you want as few workers as possible with as much output as possible. And, and if you're a, you know, if you're a worker, a, a citizen, let's say, then the time that you spend in work is supposed to be a sacrifice. And in, in conventional economics, that's why you're paid to work is because you're sacrificing your time um, for that employment. So, so if you think about it, and he says this in that, in that essay, you know, in, in, in capitalism, essentially, work is a, a cost to producers and a sacrifice to workers. And so the ideal is to have output without employees and income without employment, which is, you know, kind of, it, it does away with the whole idea that actually work is the way that we participate in society. It's the way that we give services to each other. It's the way that we take a, a role in creating value in our society. It can be an enjoyable, under the right circumstances, you know, it can be an enjoyable thing. Work is a, is a kind of way of, of taking our human energy, bringing it into society and dedicating it to the common good. And that all gets lost in capitalism. And so actually what you find is that particularly under capitalism, you know, the, the work of, of care workers, for example, has been overlooked for generations and they find themselves, you know, at the front line of the pandemic with insecure wages, with long hours, with no job security sometimes, with impossible working conditions, because we have not in society looked after that idea of, of work. And that, mm. you know, that to me is a kind of a, tra a travesty, a tragedy almost, because we're living inside an economic system that's undermining the single thing that actually could give the most meaning to our lives, which is our relationship to society. So, and that's, so I'm using work there as a kind of example of what I think the process of, should be of answering your questions, because your questions are all very precise, you know, how many hours are we working? <laughs> what are we getting paid for it? You know, this kind of thing. And I'm saying, no, first, there's another task. We think about what work is, and then we can begin to answer those questions. And then we can begin to say, in the society of the future, we care about the people who care for us. We make sure that their livelihoods are secure. We think of the health system actually as a part of the value in society rather than a cost to society. And we organize the financial incentives, we organize the, the work structures, we organize the wage policies, we organize the value of the way we think about those people in a different way. And so, you know, I can get to answers to all your questions, but they're quite precise sort of details which have to be kind of worked about out along the way and the fundamental process is that one of re-examining where work went wrong and how we can set it right again beautifully put i love the pushback too because it's a, a resisting of of sort of i mean post-capitalism meets post-colonialism right it's it's resisting the sort of universal one-size-fits-all solution that you're imposing from the top down on all people in all contexts and saying no there needs to be a process that's democratic and collaborative um so i appreciate I, that i think that's really that's really important you know it's kind of it's really important to see that context is different in different places and, and it's also really important to kind of think, well, context is very different in places, but also values can change in relation to mm. that context. And yet there are certain things that bind us together, you know, that we are human. And a part of being human is that actually that desire to be, to participate in the society in which we live in and to do that in meaningful ways. So it's kind of like saying, you know, here's our fundamental DNA and this is the context we've put it in, which is just driving us into distraction and crazy situations. Maybe there's another thing which is more, uh, you know, which is more accurate. It's more loyal to who we are as people and to human values. So I, I want to ask about uh, corporations, sort of you're thinking these large companies, you talked about businesses uh, in relation to workers and this sort of sacrifice model. Uh, is there a role for Amazon, Apple, Walmart in a post growth world? Um, I mean, how would these businesses be affected by this, this new paradigm? 
Oh, well, they'd have to pay their taxes. You know, that's the first thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good start. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, you know, to be honest, when you talk about corporations that big, there's risk. Um, and, and what's extraordinary is that Adam Smith, who's kind of seen as the, the father of the invisible hand of the market, the perfect vehicle for making organizing society is this invisible hand of the market. We should just have free markets. Governments should get out of the way. You know, let's get the market work. That's, that's how people think of Adam Smith. That's how they kind of interpret his, his economics. But actually, in a, in a book called The Moral Sentiments, he was absolutely adamant that, you know, the, the place where business gets too big and where corporations have too much power, there is only one thing that can offset that power, and that is big government. So, you know, you've got to have that weight there in order to offset the damage that can happen when, you, when these huge monopoly powers are beginning to influence society. And I think when we're looking at companies like Amazon and um, uh, uh, in particular, some of the tech companies, the social media companies, you know, those companies now have extraordinary power in society, sometimes enough power you know, as I was suggesting, not to pay their taxes in, in the right place or to, you know, kind of not to pay their workers in the right way, not to compensate people properly, not to look after environmental standards properly. And that is dangerous to society. And there, there's only one thing really that can offset that danger, which is, which is having powerful government and, and ensuring that taxes are paid, ensuring that workers are properly protected. Um, ensuring that environmental standards are coded into the way that people trade. So to me, there is, and to Adam Smith, I would add, you know, there is an inherent danger in very, very big companies. And, and, to, and when he was talking about the invisible hand, what he was actually talking about was the social relationships that keep people honest when you mm. have small companies in relatively well-connected com communities where people know each other and know when somebody is cheating. And, and that's, you know, that's a million miles from where we are with these, some of these big tech companies. And it's a place that we have to be pretty, um, we have to be pretty wary of, I think. Yeah, and it sounds like, again, balance becomes an important theme. Um, so big corporations have to be, you know, met with big government to find that sort of balance, um, which yeah. I don't know, I mean, does that mean that we can't rely on, on corporations, uh, leaders to sort of self-regulate to say, oh, you know, I, I, I've consumed too enough, you know, I'll, 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 I'll stop getting profits. I mean, no, I, I think we don't. I, and, and enlightened corporate leaders actually realize that you can't just rely on self-regulation. And, and so actually, you know, it's dangerous, to, it's dangerous to them in a way, because if you are, if you're an enlightened you know, CEO, and, and there are enlightened CEOs, there are people who really get this agenda and really want change, and are really trying to do the right thing. But you're in a position if you're a C CEO of a company, let's say in the finance sector, and you try to only invest in things which don't damage the planet, and everybody else mm -hmm. is allowed to invest in all the dangerous stuff, you know, not only are they taking away your your capital market, but they're also undermining the playing field that you're trying to make things work on. And so they're dangerous to your own profitability and your own sustainability as a company. And so, and, and what you'll find is that, you know, in those companies where, where those, where the CEOs get that, that they will argue actually that they need government to step in to create that living level playing field to provide incentives in the right direction so let's say you know your company or a finance institution investing in renewable energy and you find out that actually you know governments across the world are committing five trillion dollars every year to subsidies to fossil fuels that's directly undermining your own ability to to be a successful renewable energy company or to have successful returns if you invest in those renewable energy companies so it's a you know it's a kind of it is necessary to have a. Um, it's necessary to have regulation. It's always been. Again, that's something that Adam Smith was pointing out in that comment. You, you know, the free market doesn't mean you don't have reg regulation. It means you have regulation to ensure that that free market is fair and equal and is and is socially desirable. Um, and and that this idea that actually, you know, at the COP twenty six, for example, this um, 
um, it's called Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or it might be Global Alliance for Net Zero. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, it was announced last week, $130 trillion of assets under management has now aligned itself with a net zero target in 2050. But there's nothing mandatory about how soon carbon is reduced within that. There isn't even a protection against investing in fossil fuels amongst those companies. And none of them are really moving at a speed or a scale at which we would be able to be confident that we could remain within 1.5 degrees. So that's a big voluntary jamboree of people saying, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. You know, keep investing your money with me. And and it's 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 actually potentially dangerous to be believing that that's a kind of solution to the scientific evidence for climate change. And to come back to that point, the kids on the street know that and they're calling it out. Right. You can't just say it's going to be business as usual for the next 25 years and then we'll get get to work uh, dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a couple of thoughts then on where we can go next in this conversation. I, I, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go dark with us. Okay. Uh, is environmental or economic collapse necessary for the emergence of a post-growth economy? Um, I, I don't think it is. Um, Yay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> next question. Yeah. I, you know, I, but I know people who do think it is, you sure. know, and I think, I think why I resist, why I resist it. So, so, and the people who do think it is would kind of say to me, you know, your hope is a false hope, Tim. You know, you're not facing up to reality here. You think we can pull this out of the fire. You think these guys are going to turn themselves around on their head and it's all going to change. And, you know, to some extent, to some extent that is, you know, they're right to call us out if that's the only thing we've got to go on. But I don't think it's the only thing we've got to go on. You know, I do think that, First of all, I think that what's happening on the streets is really interesting in terms of already holding governments to the fire and holding change to the fire in terms of, you know, something more profound than what we were talking about just now. And I think also, and it's a kind of belief really in a way that if we can, that almost all of us, our culture, almost all of our civilization is really based around our ideas ideas about ourselves, ideas about our goals, ideas about our values, but they're ideas that are now outdated. You know, they belonged to centuries ago and they belonged to a certain kind of form of civilization that maybe it was doing its job at the time, but it's kind of stopped doing it now. And so, you know, what I see is that the potential to reinvent that culture is huge and it lies in our hands. And I think that process can occur even without us falling into that ecological catastrophe. And and the reason I would rather it happen that way is because I think when society breaks down, it's quite difficult to pick up the pieces. And there's quite Mm -hmm. a long period actually where what you're condemning the world to in a way is, you know, a new form of suffering. And it may be that, you know, maybe we do have to go through that suffering. Maybe that is inevitable. Maybe it's justice, you know, maybe it's, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children, even unto the seventh generation, you know, and the, it is some kind of colonial, post-colonial reparations that have to be paid. Maybe that is there waiting for us. But, it, but the transitions that tend to be kinder, to be, to be um, less disruptive, to be places without suffering, to be places where we don't descend into the darkness are the ones which are gentler, smoother, transformations of, of value um, that lead us out of the darkness rather than plunging us into mm. that darkness first. I mean, I, you know, I guess I would say that either way, and we don't really know the answer, do we have to go right. down before we can get out or do we have to, or can we find our way out of it? It seems to me that either way, the process that we need is that questioning of values and reframing of the values that we want society to have either now or later post-apocalypse if we have to do that but uh, but if the more we can do that now it seems to me the less we have to risk 
the darkness of that apocalypse. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big fan of minimizing global suffering. <laughs> so, um, you yeah. know, so how do we get there, right? Uh, what, what does this transition look like? What, uh, how do we begin to transform our values and our systems? You know, are there, can you name some, some major obstacles in realizing this vision and identify some key leverage points for change? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, there's, so, so there's a kind of interest, the two questions there, really. Let me, let me try and answer the one of them and then the other one. Um, if I can remember them all through it. But the first, first quite the kind of question is, you know, how, how do we get there? And the second one is kind of, you know, where are the major obstacles? And so the how do we get there? It seems to me we, we sort of already begun to an extent. You know, when I sat down to write Post Growth, it was in a pre-pandemic world. And actually I ended up having to rewrite quite a lot of it because of, you know, what happened in the pandemic. But some of what happened in the pandemic was really educational um, you know, not just this idea that it's health that's the foundation of our prosperity, but also that when that foundation is threatened, it's the legitimate role of government to do rapidly very, very different things. And, and many, many governments did, not all governments, I have to say. And, you know, perhaps you're living in a country where that wasn't one of the governments that, that did do things rapidly. But in many countries that, that did happen very rapidly. So I was sitting down writing about post-growth and post-capitalism in a world that was still firmly wedded to growth and capitalism. And within a few months, I was looking at a world in which growth had disappeared. It had been stopped basically because health mattered more than growth. And in which many of the assumptions of capitalism were laid aside for the moment. So we stopped, you know, we stopped that idea of expansion. We stopped um, kind of the idea that government couldn't intervene in supply chains. And actually that was one of the places where Donald Trump did intervene. He called up legislation that was 50 or 60 years old in order to allow the government to, to use supply chains and to organize supply chains in a different way. We started building hospitals rapidly, um, you know, providing a kind of a step change not just in the infrastructure of our lives, but in the assumptions, the ideological assumptions that lay behind what governments could and couldn't do. And, and I think of it like this, I think of it as, you know, during that time we were, we were building a kind of lifeboat economy. We, you know, the, the, the liner had sunk and we were getting people into lifeboats as soon as possible. And, and and we had to organize things you know, slightly differently. Community became very, very important. Community response became very important. There was a, a call here in my country, in the UK, you know, very early on for, community, for people to sign up to a, a community responder volunteers to help the National Health Service. And in the matter of a few days, 750,000 people signed up to it. And that was a kind of indication that, you know, that when push comes to shove, People are not inclined to kind of hole up and protect themselves and get into a little huddle and say, you know, stay away from me with your infection. They actually wanted to be able to help. That enormous ability to be able to help came out during the pandemic and, and is a resource. It's a huge resource, as is the ability of government to act um, in the protection of the health of its citizens and to act fast. So those are the resources that we have and the pandemic showed us those and we used those resources to build a kind of lifeboat economy where the rules were different, where things were um, more reliant on, on, on community which, in which governments could do different things. And that has given us, it seems to me, the ability to use those lifeboats to move to a different place, to find <laughs> terra firma and to use the principles that we de delivered, developed during that need for a kind of lifeboat economy and to and to put those in place and they consist in you know yes we provide incomes for people when their incomes are threatened yes we support our health services because our health services are right at the front line of our prosperity yes we can sometimes choose which industry really matters to our prosperity and we can support that as governments and yes we can find the money to do that just as during the financial crisis we found trillions of dollars to underwrite the balance sheets of banks we could also use those dollars trillions of them to underwrite the prosperity of ordinary people and so you know to me and I, I can't you know obviously there's lots and lots of tasks along the way there 
But I think what I'm trying to articulate is this, this idea that the lifeboat economics of the pandemic provide us with a sense of vision for how we should mm. develop a post-pandemic economy. That's really interesting, that um, the sort of transition from a lifeboat economy to a life economy. Um, yeah. But I think it's, um, I hadn't thought about this, but the, basically, I mean, how it perhaps reveals um, the underlying values of society that when push comes to shove, we do say, no, 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 we have to take care of one another. We have to change. Um, government steps in, people volunteer. Um, and very quickly on a global scale, we're seeing radical change in human behavior um, and expectations. Um, so maybe, maybe, uh, Humans aren't as bad as I thought. Okay, maybe I have reason to hope. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think, I think, I think that's right. I, you know, I think, um, I, I think there's kind of really interesting stories. One of, the, one of them is that during the Second World War, you know, the, the German um, strategy in the Blitz in bombing London was that it would break Londoners' spirits. You know, it would, it would drive the spirits of the nations down and they would necessarily, uh, want to concede peace uh, in, for the sake of that. And, and also, you know, that they would, that once they, once they were broken down, they would begin to turn on each other so that the social fabric would be destroyed. And, and the British used the same strategic tactic when they bombed Dresden at the, towards the end of the war, they were trying to break the spirits of people. And it's been estimated that actually that strategy backfired because it continued the war because of the resilience of people against that idea. So instead of breaking down and turning on each other under those circumstances of external threat, actually what people did was draw together and become, you know, create solidarity and, to, and, to, and for community and, and for nation and for, um, uh, you know, togetherness to be a meaningful defense against the things that we were facing. And so, so what that tells us, you know, is, is I think is, is exactly what you're saying that, of course, we have selfishness in us. There's no doubt about that. Of course, we kind of, you know, we have, we have appetites, we're avaricious, we are sometimes greedy, um, but all of those things are balanced by, you know, fundamental human values that are going in the other direction, that we care about each other, that we're compassionate for each other, that we are sometimes altruistic to the point of destruction um, and that in defense of our sense of values, there's almost nothing that we can't do. And, and that I think, you know, that is the, the place from which to start. And it's a place from which to recognize that the future is not quite as laid out by, by capitalism. And it's not quite laid out as by the collapse of capitalism. It's laid out, in fact, in principle, it's laid out by the depth of our own humanity. Mm. Yeah. And how wonderful that, um, well, if, if we could redesign human civilization around the, the core principles that are truly in our hearts, um, that'd be wonderful. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, we, you know, we have, we have to be realistic about that. And, I, and, and so I'm always very careful to sort of preface that idea by saying, you know, we're not just angels. It's, it's absolutely clear. Yeah. Um, but in a sense, and it's kind of what I'm trying to do in post growth is I'm trying to say, you know, that in capitalism, we've captured a certain idea of what it is to be human. Mm. And it's, you know, it's selfish, novelty seeking, hedonistic, profit maximizing consumers. Um, and, and actually, and I draw a lot of people into, into the book, um, you know, who represent to me, what they do is they represent a challenge to that idea. And, and sometimes from the science, scientific point of view, sometimes from the human point of view, sometimes from the spiritual point of view, they are presenting alternative visions of what it means to be human. And ultimately, we kind of are all of these things. You know, we're a tension between self and other. We're a tension between novelty seeking and tradition. Um, and, and, uh, and we're a tension between the kind of materialistic and the and the social and perhaps even the spiritual and that what we've done in capitalism is and it goes back to that 
conversation we were having before is we've destroyed the balance between those things. We've created yeah. a set of institutional structures that basically pushes us as humans into being these selfish novelty seeking consumers. And that's not who we are in the round. So in, and, and that's also quite hopeful in a way because what it suggests is that freeing ourselves from that vision that capitalism has pushed us into, that vision of ourselves it's forcing us into, is, is not you know, the hair shirt um, burden of, of, of having nothing and restricting all our appetites. Actually, it's a place where we can be more fully human. Um, and, and that's definitely a space worth exploring. So people at home listening um, may be wondering, okay, we're talking about changing values and worldviews, changing the systems and structures, you know, the alternatives to capitalism. This is massive stuff. Um, and it requires uh, a, a, a tremendous scale uh, to bring about significant change. So what can I do? Um, yeah. You know, it how does. can I help bring about global systems change? <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know? I mean, actually a review of Postgres that was published quite recently sort of said, actually there's elements of, of uh, and it was doing a twin review with another book and it sort of has elements of both of these books that are kind of self-help books, <laughs> which is which I sort of, I don't know how I feel about that. I resist it in a way, but one of the things I do do in, in Postgres is, is to argue that, you know, that imbalance that's been created by capitalism is something that we all feel at our heart. And we all feel, you know, pushed into, you know, we're kind of kids in the candy shop and we've been left there with the idea that that's the only role that we have is to consume as much candy as, as possible. And nobody's told us that it's gonna make us sick within, you know, a day or an hour or whatever. And, and, and we, it is within our rights to reclaim balance. It's always within the individual rights to reclaim balance and the balance between, between work and, and our lives, the balance between having too much and too little, you know, the balance between um, sharing the housework, for example, and, and dividing it in a way that's kind of unequal. All of these balances that are negotiated and the way that they're negotiated under capitalism are sometimes actually you know bad for us um and and by returning to that sense of balance we can find ourselves individually in a better place mm -hmm. now that's you know you, you you rightly said um it's huge tasks it requires system change you know um, what's what's the point of even almost? I mean, you were kind of suggesting what can anyone do at the individual level? What can we even think about there? So that that it seems to me is one thing that we can think about. That sort of almost self help function, but it clearly isn't enough on its own. And there, I think you know um, that the a couple of other sort of roles at different scales for people. And one is to think about, particularly to think about their working lives and the way that they are investing that time you know our precious time we're only here for a finite time on the planet what are we going to do with that time are we going to have it working in a in a you know in a job or an activity that actually we feel is contributing to our underlying values many people don't have that luxury but it is possible to kind of make changes in that area and to say well you know i was working for an oil company but now i'm going to be technical director in greenpeace as you know one of my colleagues did um, 30 40 years ago and, and after that, when I've done that job, then I'm going to work on a rewilding project to bring nature back into the north part of, of the country, as he then did. You know, it's possible to kind of to move and to reinvent and to change. And that is inevitable. That's something that has to happen on scale if we're going to make this transition. But it can also happen at the individual level. So individual can, you know, there's this self-help thing, there's the change the way that I give my energy to the world that I work in society and then I think there's another thing and it brings us right back to you know what's happening on the streets the kids on the streets were not just kids they were also you know uh, families with very young children they were pensioners they were people of working age who'd taken a day off on Fridays for the future day and and that sense of of um, activism is absolutely essential and, and some would say 
and I, again, it's something that I talk about in, in post-growth, some would say that that activism, that civil disobedience, that standing up and drawing the line and saying enough is enough, is the most legitimate part of our democratic system. The ability to say when government is not doing its job properly. And so that, you know, those three things together from self-help to the energy that we bring to the world to the civ civil disobedience, if that's what it takes, to stand up and speak truth to power, those are our rights and our responsibilities to some extent. Absolutely. So in the face of, of these complex widespread challenges, are there emerging opportunities, new developments, uh, little sparks that, that give you hope, realistic hope? Yeah, I mean, I kind of think you know, well, hope is another responsibility. It's very easy to get downhearted. It's very easy to kind of think, um, you know, this, I'm too small. There's nothing much I can do. Nobody's listening to me anyway. Um, and so what's the point? Um, and, you know, I think it's, that's a very de-energizing place to mm. be and it reduces our motivation. It makes us feel enslaved. And so actually, you know, acting against that sense of despair is really important. But I think in, there's a sense in which the, the antidote to despair isn't hope in some sort of, you know, dreamy, happy, uh, everything's gonna be fine kind of way. The antidote to despair is action. And, and finding that place where you can act in the world is something which has, you know, multiple positive consequences, both at the individual level and for society. I love that. The antidote to despair is action. That's, that's a great line. Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, before we conclude? This has been a, a fun conversation. Um, no, not really. I mean, you know, thank you for all your work and for the space that you're creating. The part of what I wanted to do really, uh, particularly in that latter book, was to exactly to do that, was to create the space for the conversation. And I've had some terrific conversations myself as a result of that. And this is one of them. But my kind of hope for that process is that it ripples out there and and it's in that space that ideas change and ideas change our world and and we need that more than ever absolutely and i i agree this has been a wonderful conversation and i do hope that it, it ripples out and uh, continues to be a, a a broader public conversation as that overton window opens a little wider thank you for your time um which is not life uh which is life not money right? Time is, is life. Yeah. Um, although it feels weird to thank you for your life. Um, so I, I'll just thank you for your time. Um, for those <laughs> it who makes are it sound a little bit, a, no, it yeah. just sounds a little too much like it's over. <laughs> exactly. Said, Thanks exactly. for your life, Tim. No, I, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And um, I really appreciate the time that you spent with me. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are listening, um, you want to learn more about uh, Tim's work, um, I really encourage you to check out his recent book, Post Growth, Life After Capitalism. It's a great read. Thank you very much, Cheers, Tim. Andrew. Bye.